I was a child during the Troubles. We used to play here at Bebo Road and across the river opposite the parochial hall at Harmony Villas in a big hollowed out dead tree. We never found anything here at the Iron Bridge but just a little way up. The Donnybrook Bridge was a search point from 1916 onwards where there was an ambush of such like was happening. The army would put a barrier in the class and search pedestrians and pedestrians. We picked up at least six revolvers, several cans of bullets from the river, beneath the bridge over the years, where apparently they had been dropped into the river before the search. Then we played with them and we used to be carefully buy them away. One time one of the number found what appeared to be a leg of an armchair with a ring at the end of it. He was bashing it off the rocks in the river to get the ring off. The tram conductor looking from the bridge told him to stop and get away at once and proceeded to come down from the bridge and took the thing into the tram shed where the most is definitely is now. We saw him open it and take out a revolver. In about 1922, a notice appeared on the board at the police station saying that a reward would be given for all arms that would be handed in. One day we decided to collect what we had hidden away near the river. At least six revolvers, one sword, two bayonets, and several cowboy cans filled with bullets, small, medium, and very large, about nine inches. Some of the medium bullets had four cuts in the silvery part. Having draped them ourselves to make our equipment as obvious as possible and with a revolver stuck in our braces, we marched to the police station, much to the astonishment of the passerby. When we arrived, we were ushered into a sparsely furnished room and told that the man who dealt with the rewards was out. Pending his return, a list of the articles will be made and our name and address taken, so that if a reward was paid, they would let us know. The only thing that happened was that our names got around the village and my parents gave me a hoist by having such dangerous things. They never knew that many a bullet had been sent on its way from between two large stones by striking the cap with small sharp stones.
have seen what happened in the AOH Hall. There was a meeting of the Donnybrook Brigade, right where that fire station is now, on 28th of September, 1914. I know, because I was there. We were there to discuss the call to arms by John Redmond. He wanted us to help defend the British Empire. He said it was our duty to defend small nations and that it would help us get home rule in the end. But De Valera was having none of it. He said, and he often did this sort of thing, grandstanding some people called it, he said, I disagree entirely with this position and the parting of the ways is common. Then he said that there were obviously two different camps on the matter, for and against enlistment, and he was totally against enlistment. So he said, those who side with Ireland will go to this side of the hall, and those who would like to support the British Empire go over there with Redmond on the other side of the hall. So that's what happened. The hall divided into two parts, and then they counted how many people were on each side. And in De Valera's camp, there were three people less than there were in Redmond's camp for enlistment. So De Valera, to save his honor, had to walk out. And I walked out with him and some of the other supporters that were for him. Dev's parting cry as he walked out the door was, he leaned over his shoulder and looked back and said, we'll need us before he get home real. And possibly he was right. We didn't know it then. But this was one of the first of many splits around the country that split the Irish volunteer movement into the Redmanite and the Owen McNeil trenches. There was about 50 of us volunteers who marched out of the AOH Hall with Dev, and he continued with his drills in Donnybrook, up by Donnybrook Church, and in number nine, Beaver Row, in the disused Wesleyan Chapel. The parades were held in a field opposite Donnybrook Church, but in a short, few short weeks, I stayed, but many of the men drifted away. At one time, there was only seven of us left, not counting Dev. But even with that small number, Dev Valero carried on as if he had a full company keeping it together. The number would then increase when we were joined by the remnants of the Dun Drum Company, who had also parted ways with Redmond. So we got a drill hall in Beaver Row in the former Wesleyan Chapel, and our number soon increased to about 40 in the Donnybrook branch. Believe me, we needed every man. Okay, we're now going to go to the Molly Woods. I came back to Ireland and the following February I was married to Andrew Wood of Donnybrook. My father-in-law was a dairyman and a builder and at first we lived in one of his houses in Edmonton Terrace. Horrid Pierce was a major influence on our political views and that's why when we came here to St. Andrews, we called I heard from the McGlynns, who were in the citizen army, and from the
Molly. It's good to see you again in all our old haunts, so to speak. So, these people would like to know more about my life. Very well. I'm Liam Mellows. I was born in May 1895 in Manchester, but I grew up here in Ireland, in County Wexford. I was an Irish Republican and a Sinn Féin politician, helping to form the Fianna into a nationwide organisation. I was active in the IRB and a founding member of the Irish Volunteers. At the age of 21, I led my company alongside Airman de Valeras on a gun running mission from Holt to Dublin. Then I was sent to Galway where I set up my base at Athenry. Now it was here I met Sean McDermott, who was arrested at an anti-enlistment rally in May 1915. Now I got away then, but I was arrested in July at Courtown Harbour and sentenced to three months. We were both sentenced to Mountjoy Prison. Now I continued working when I got out, but I was arrested again. At this time, the British took me by train to Arbor Hill Prison and then shipped me off to England. But, with the help of Nora and James Connolly, I escaped from Reading Prison and disguised as a priest, I returned to Ireland. Returning to Galway to command the Western Division of the IRA during the 1916 Rising. I led 700 volunteers on attacks on Royal Irish Constabulary Stations in Oran Moor and Claren Bridge in County Galway, taking over the town of Athenry. When I met Molly during the War of Independence, I was the IRA's Director of Purchasing, responsible for buying arms. In the 1918 general election, I was elected as a Sinn Féin candidate to the first stall as a candidate for North Mead and East Galway. Now Molly let me use her house as my Dublin headquarters, controlling and funding the supply of arms to the volunteers during the War of Independence. And it was here in Molly's house where I shared a room with another volunteer, Sean Etchingham. In December 1921, the Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed. Now the British must have known that this could lead to a civil war during Ireland, during the time between May, June 1922 and May 1923. Now, I was against this treaty, for I believed that it undermined the principles of the Republic which we had fought for. And during this time, this conflict, the anti, the pro-treaty forces officially executed 77 members of the anti-treaty Republican forces. As I said, I was against this treaty. And it was in June 1922, when I entered the Four Courts with fellow Republicans, Rory O'Connor, Joe McKelvey, and Richard Barrett, the anti-treaty forces had been occupying it since April. Now we were there for the bombardment by the pro-treaty forces. And we surrendered after only two days. Now I had a chance to escape, but I didn't take it. The Free State imprisoned myself and O'Connor, McKelvey and Barrett at Mountjoy Prison. Now we were held there for months without a trial. Now to pass the time away, in my cell, I began carving out chess pieces. Now suddenly, at half past three one morning, we were awoken and informed that at eight o'clock that morning, we were to be executed as a reprisal for the death of Sean Hales. Now I used what little time I had left to write messages to my loved ones. At five o'clock, I wrote a letter to my mother, Sarah. I remember I started the message by saying, the time is short, 
and much of what I have to say must go unsaid. But you will understand. In such times, heart speaks to heart. I believed in the pre-treaty division of the Irish Republic. And it was my dying wish that once again my fellow Irishmen would be once again reunited with this vision. But I did not live to see this. For the 8th of December, 1922, must be the last day of my life. For at 8 o'clock that morning, we were taken from our cells, marched outside, and executed by firing squad. We were devastated when we heard the news. The first time I saw my husband cry was when he heard of your execution. Andrew came with me to claim your body. We took the car and on the way we met Mrs. McBride and Mrs. Desperate. <coughs> we went to fetch your mother, drove to Mountjoy and asked that your body be released into our custody. But to no satisfaction. Then we went out to Tim Healy's house in the Lippy Valley, and as we approached the gate, we were halted. A Free State soldier from Donnybrook, who had been in the British Army, recognized me and said, No, Mrs. Woods, you can't go there. But he sent another soldier to us to take a message for His Excellency. We demanded the body of Lee Mellows executed earlier that day. The soldier came back with the answer that there was nothing His Excellency could do in this matter, and that it was to Garold O'Sullivan, the Adjutant General, that we would have to go. So we went to Michael Comyon to take the necessary steps. He made a phone call and made our request. Immediately the phone went dead. We had no further success in making contact. You were buried in Mount Joy. Several years later, when De Valera was in power, your body was removed and brought to Castletown Cemetery in Wexford, a few miles from Arklow, where your mother's people were born. An annual commemoration service is, he is held at your graveside. You are not forgotten. But what a waste, such promise. You were only 27. So I'm the ghost of uh, Joseph Plunkett. My father, George Noble Plunkett, was a paper count. But while my life was privileged in some ways, it was not easy. I can't hear you, not here. I contacted TV when I was young and suffered from a I spent some time in the Mediterranean and North Africa, as the climate was better for me. But I was always interested in our heritage and the Irish language. Did you know I studied Esperanto? I was one of the founders of the Irish Esperanto League. I joined the Gaelic League and studied with Thomas MacDonald. We shared an interest in poetry and theatre. <coughs> and we joined the Irish Volunteers. In 1915, I joined the IRB and was sent to Germany where I met Roger Casement. I got a promise of a German arms shipment to 
coincide with the rising, which I had a large role in planning. But my health still let me down. I ended up going to hospital to have an operation on my neck lens. It was a struggle to get out of my sick bed to get to the GPO. To get to the GPO. People still noticed my neck still bandaged and I couldn't be as active as I would have liked. My aide de camp was Michael Collins. I fell in love with a lovely girl, Grace Gifford. I proposed to her in 1915. Grace accepted and took formal instruction in Catholic doctrine, becoming a Catholic. We planned to marry on Easter Sunday, 1916. Thomas was marrying her sister, Muriel. Her parents were not happy about her marrying me because I was so young. After the rising, we surrendered. And the British began executing all of our leaders, including Thomas and me. When Grace learned I was to be shot, she bought a ring in a jeweler's shop in Dublin city centre and with the help of a priest, persuaded the military authorities to allow us to marry. We married on the third night of May in the chapel of Kilmainham Jail seven hours before my execution. I was only 28, the youngest signatory of the proclamation to be executed. On a little motorbike, as with several Irish men of my generation, a significant turning point came on the 25th of November 1913 when I and many of my companions in the Gaelic League went to the Rotunda for an inaugural meeting of the Irish volunteers. At that meeting I experienced a real dilemma. Enrollment forms were handed out and after the speeches I considered whether I should join I was married, and my wife and children were dependent on me. And I had no doubt that the formation of the volunteers meant that there would be an armed selection. I decided that our manpower was such that the movement was confined to unmarried men. It would not be numerous enough to succeed. So I crossed that Rubicon and joined. While I had not previously been involved with militant republicanism, I devoted myself with diligence and commitment to the cause and began to make a name for myself among the volunteers. In 1914, May of that year, I was elected captain of the new company here in Donnybrook and I later led my men into the hot gun running. I remember well Redmond's call to arms at the AOH Hall on the 28th of September 1914. Mr. Redmond was a member of the British Parliament 
and anxious for Ireland's full participation in a bloody war against Germany then being fought in, on the continent. As I was completely opposed to his point of view, I had no choice but to condemn it, which is why I and the majority of my men walked out of that meeting. When I tried to reorganize the company under the reformed Irish volunteers, only seven men expressed an interest. But I didn't let this discourage me. We went on to drill, and over time we made up the numbers. Following the rising, I went on to lead the Republican movement during the War of Independence, became leader of the anti-treaty forces during the Civil War, and became your Taoiseach and President of Ireland. You probably have heard many stories about my dramatic escape from Lincoln Prison in 1919. I managed to borrow a key at Mass and steal some candles. I made an impression of the key in the wax. This was smuggled out and my friends made several attempts to make a working duplicate, sending them cakes. Finally, I was sent a cake with a blank key and files in it and got a working key. My wife Sinead died on the 17th of January 1975 on the eve of our 65th wedding anniversary and I died in Linden convalescence home Black Rock on the 29th of August 1975 at the age of 92. God save the Republic. I am the ghost of Michael Joseph O'Rahilly. I see you have an interest in history. Would you like to hear a little bit about my life? Yes. Yeah. 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 I was originally from Bally Longford, County Kerry, but I used to live in number 40, Herbert Park Road, with my darling wife Nancy and our children. My friends, Owen McNeil and Andrew and Molly Woods, live nearby. I will tell you what I can to help you understand. I was born on the 22nd of April, 1875, and I died on the 29th of April, 1916. I had a good education and opportunities to travel. I spent about 10 years in the US and in Europe before settling down here in Herbert Park, Herbert Road. I am a proud, I am proud that I was an Irish Republican and a nationalist and a founding member of the Irish Volunteers in 1913. I have to say from the start I was not party to the plans of the Easter Rising nor was I a member of the Irish Republican Brotherhood but I was one of the main people who trained the Irish Volunteers for the fight for our independence which we knew was coming in the future. Some of us volunteers were against taking unprovoked, one-sided action. We feared we would not have popular support and it would lead to unpredictable numbers of military and civilian casualties and would therefore be unlikely to succeed. The people who planned the Easter Rising were well aware of our position and they went to a lot of trouble to prevent us from learning that the rising was imminent. Those of us who were to be kept in the dark included Owen, who was the chief of staff, Bumbler Hobson and myself. When Bumbler, when Hobson, discovered that an insurrection was planned, he was kidnapped by the military council's leadership. When I heard this, I went straight to Patrick Pierce's school on Good Friday I barged right into Pierce's study, brandishing my revolver in the air, and explained, whoever kidnaps me, 
will have to be a quicker shot. Pierce calmed me down. I assure you, he said, Hobson is unharmed. We will release him after the rising begins. The whole country was due to be on maneuvers on Easter Sunday. We found out this was the cover for the start of an armed insurrection. Owen McNeil wrote a letter to Father Flanagan countermanding the order to mobilize. He urged all priests and anyone with any influence with the Irish volunteers should advise the men to go home and take off the uniforms. Owen asked me to travel around the country and try and get the rising called off. When I got back to Dublin on Sunday, I learned that the rising was about to begin anyway. On the next day, Easter Monday, 24th of April, 1916, despite my efforts to stop it, I set out to Liberty Hall in my Dion Bourgeon motor car, my last ever journey in it, to join Pierce and Connolly and the other leaders with the Irish volunteers and the Irish Citizen Army troops. The Citizen Army was lined, lined up in front of the hall in deep formation. And on the steps of the hall, James Connolly and Countess Markovich were being photographed. They knew that I thought the action was doomed and had tried to stop it. So they were surprised that I turned up. I explained, well, I helped wind up the clock. I might as well hear it strike. And that is how I ended up in the GPO on Easter Monday. On Friday the 28th of April, with the GPO on fire, I volunteered to lead a party of men along the route to Williams and Woods factory on Great Britain Street. A British machine gunner had the intersection of Great Britain and Moore Street cut me and several others down and wounded me, wounded me badly. I stumbled into a doorway on Moore Street, but hearing the English marking my position, I managed to cross the road and find shelter in Sackville Lane. They renamed it O'Rahali Parade after me. I was wounded diagonally from the shoulder to the hip by sustained fire from the machine gunner. For 19 hours I lay there. There was a British officer guarding me, making sure no one could come to my aid. I can't help wondering if the ambulance driver was able to allow, allowed to pick me up, maybe I could have survived. I managed to write a farewell letter to my wife in blood on the back of a letter I received in the GPO from my son. I sent them all my love and told them it was a good fight anyhow. My body was released to my family and following a funeral mass in Donnybrook Church was interned in Glasnevin. My husband was a builder and he built our house, number one Brandon Road. He actually built the entire road and he built many houses in and around Donnybrook. He built in secret hiding places for men on the run and for weapons. I believe he named the street Brandon Road after the patron saint of his native Kerry. <clears throat> I was not directly associated with any movement except for the Gaelic League, which I joined shortly after I came to Dublin. We regularly attended the classes and other events together, but um, I had my domestic occupations as I was a mother looking after my house and my children. And I didn't have, for reasons of security, I was not allowed to have a maid in the house or even a daily woman. <clears throat> um, as well as teaching Irish, the Gaelic League was a recruiting grounds for the uh, volunteers and the IRB. And um, there were very important meetings held at my house and I became acquainted with the volunteers. Among them were Sean McDermott, Con Collins, Cahill Brugat, 
and Charlie Donovan, who was a great man in connection with arms and ammunition. I had a great pleasure in looking after Sean McDermott. Uh, a few months before the rising, he had to go in the Matter Hospital because he got neuritis in his leg and he almost lost the use of it. So at Christmas 1915, my husband bought him to stay in our house and he stayed with us five weeks. Against doctor's orders, he left the hospital because he was so determined to be a part of the fight. Um, during the time he stayed with us, there was not a day went by when some of the leading men did not come to see him. And this is when I met Thomas McDonough, Major McBride, and many other, many other men whom I did not meet again as they lost their lives in the fight. So during the weeks preceding the Easter Rising, the many arms and ammunition were bought to our house here at Brendan Road, and they were stored in a building plot that was at the end of the road. And two boxes of cartridges were bought inside the house, and they were hidden in every location they could find, including the hollow curbs and the fireplaces. And during the days preceding the rising, uh, soldiers and the volunteers, they came up to the house in pairs, in singles and in groups, and they fetched all the arms and ammunition. But there was still some ammunition left in the building plot. So on the day after the rising, on the Monday after the rising, the, um, the house was actually raided. And it was raided a few times afterwards, but this was the worst raid that I ever had. And I felt very alone as I only had my five young children with me. And the military, they evidently expected to find um, men in arms in the house, but they actually found nothing. And they were really disappointed at finding nothing in the house. So they said, will you take me down to the building yard to see what was there? So I brought them down to the building yard and they were walking around the plot and they walked right over where the stuff was stored, but they still got nothing. And um, the officer said to me, I'm really sorry, <laughs> Mrs. O'Connor, for the disturbance, but we must do our duty. And um, I said, oh, it's all right, you got nothing anyway. And I felt this like great satisfaction just being able to say you got nothing. <laughs> So um, after the rising, well, dur during Easter week, actually, Bat was sent to Kerry to await the instructions about the, the rising that they had planned over there. And I was in great anxiety during the week because I didn't know where my husband was. And I, I hadn't seen him since he left our house for, for Kerry on Good Friday. But a few days after the surrender, a messenger came to me and he, he gave me notice, a message that I could come and see my husband. And the message was written on the flap of the envelope and it was in Bat's handwriting and it was signed by him. And he, he said that he was in Richmond Barracks. He'd been detained there. So the very next day I went over to see Bat and we only had a few moments to speak to each other. We just discussed general business and everything. And um, we only were able to exchange a few details. And then he was sent off to England, in prison in England for four months he was first in Wandsworth and then he was in Frangoch. And um, during his time in prison, he made friends with Michael Collins. And when they were released, they helped each other reform the IRB and the Sinn Féin organization. Um, Michael Collins uh, was, um, was a very interesting man and Bat had a great influence on him. And Bat convinced him to go to London to form part of the Anglo-Irish Treaty delegation. And after he signed it, he returned to Ireland and he confided his despair in Bath again. But he only stayed in our house on one or two occasions as it was too dangerous a place for him. Um, number 23 of Brendan Road, Michael Collins stayed there and that was a place where his secretary and his aunt lived. And it was another secret place for him. And number six, which was under the ownership of Doyle Aaron, was another place for Michael Collins. So, um, Oh, one night when Michael stayed, Michael Collins stayed and, um, and um, Harry Boland as well and Bat and the three of them were in the kitchen together and they used to sit around chatting and uh, Michael was talking about his life in London and Bat was talking about his life in America and Harry Boland used to say, oh, there's no place like Dublin, Dublin's the best and uh, 
he said, oh, he said to me, do you, do you ever know, do you know that anything better than going out on one of the outside cars on a sunny afternoon and going down to the strawberry beds and singing old Dublin songs like Cockles and Muscles. That was his, that was his favorite part of life, I think. So um, that night, Mick and Harry Boland, they slept in the return room in the house and uh, they slept in the one bed together and there was a little window just open at the end of the bed uh, so that they could escape easily if the place was raided. And I never went to sleep when they were staying there because I was just too scared the place was going to be raided. I didn't sleep a wink. So that night, I remember I crept in gently just to check everything was okay and that they weren't, you know, they hadn't been taken away or whatever. So, uh, yeah, I remember I noticed they were fast asleep. But Michael Collins had his hand on the little bedside table and there was a revolver right underneath it. So, yeah, it just goes to show. Uh, Thomas Ash also stayed in the house for a week and he was... Uh, a wonderful man that my husband was very fond of. He uh, he was a very noble man with a, a tall figure and I'll always remember him. He had lovely wavy hair and he was just one of the nicest people. He got detained in Mountjoy Prison and I still have a letter that he sent me from Mountjoy Prison. He, um, I think his death for me was the greatest tragedy of all the deaths. So after the rising, the meetings continued to be taking place here at Brandon Road and uh, Austin Stack, Michael Collins, Harry Bowen, they all came here. But Michael Collins, which is very interesting, as much as he came here for meetings, I felt I knew him the least because he was always too engrossed in his important occupations. He never took part in any small talk. And he, um, the women, like they worked for him and they knew this about him, but they overlooked it because they knew he had so much on his mind that he couldn't take part in small talk. So everybody, it gives me great solace to know that I had the honor of looking after all these great men, putting up with them and washing their clothes and everything and cooking for them. And um, the fact that they sacrificed their lives for Ireland. I'd be very happy to do it all over again. Thank you. Similar to um, 
I need the other name is Plain Pair Most Important Part. The French Embassy, I think, is up for sale, but it's obviously very worthwhile. Ryan's, Ryan's, Ryan's. Is it? Ryan's. Oh, the Ryan Air Flight. Okay. Well, not him, but some of the family. Okay, and I don't yeah. believe they're doing yeah. anything with the jet. Nice it's number 36 up on the left if you want to go on your own, own walk sometime. It's number 36. It's still there. Sorry. Well, okay. I said yeah, we're going to back to Wait, left. wait, wait. Sorry. I want to say a couple of things first. Just wanted to bring in the bit about Ernie and Mary. Yes, there was a bit. Sorry, oh, you have a bit. Okay. Um, well, yeah, in 1922, when the Civil War broke out between the Republican and the State forces, the House was used as the headquarters of what today would be called the resistance. It was called by the Free State the Irregulars and what was called by themselves the Republicans. So Ernie O'Malley was the chief of staff of the Irish Republican Army. He stayed some time with Sheila and her sister in uh, number 36. And he felt he had kind of, a, of an easy life there because they had three meals a day, a nice bed to sleep in, and they played tennis. You know, while he was on the run. So it was a little awkward, you know, when other people didn't have such good conditions. And Michael Collins was saying in every single place there was, I think in the city, probably the fewer houses he didn't hide in than the ones he did. But when Ernie O'Malley lived there, on, on one morning on November 4th, 1922, the Free State forces raided the house. They got in the word somehow that Ernie O'Malley was there. And in fact, very suspiciously, they went right up the stairs to the very hidden room where he was. And the room was well hidden behind the wardrobe and the secret door, and they knew exactly where it was. And people wondered, how did they find out? Did that O'Connor you know, tell him? Did, uh, did some worker let it go? Had they found it out some other way? But in any case, he shot, they don't really know. One of the three state soldiers was shot, and there was a big debate about who shot him. And Ernie O'Malley was shot 12 times trying to escape, and remarkably survived. And he survived to write a book called On Another Man's Womb, which is the two. It's been described as the, as the first real classic of that period, so it's well worth reading. Yeah, this lady's read it. Anybody else read it? Okay, now, but this is the official end of the tour, and then anybody who wants to can either go on to the park for the big celebrations, or back to Beaver Road for a couple of tea. Very careful of these lights. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for coming on the tour. Really appreciate it. And we're very happy to have you correct any facts that we may have got wrong.